Hello there, everyone, and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in Red Dusk. I'm your host, Mr. Muckle Lover. Uh, but as you can see on the screen, we have a little thing to read about the United States. First of all, hello, I see you've just decided to play as the United States, and I'm sure by now you've noticed that they don't have nearly as much content compared to the USSR or Yugoslavia, at least at the time of this recording. Don't worry, the US will be getting their own content up in the future with foreign involvements, political drama, congressional deb debacles, and much more. In the meantime, though, the humble Red Dusk devs have decided to make a set of interim focus trees for all three, technically four, political parties. Along with this, we have put in a slur of different par possible presidential candidates for each party throughout the 2000, 2004, and 2008 elections, all of which you'll be able to choose in the upcoming primaries. <clears throat> Though I must note that not all of these candidates will be available in the next US update. And while, yes, the interim trees are not that big, the trees that, that will replace them in the next content update will be quite expensive. We can promise that. If you wish to see the US update come out sooner, feel free to join the Red Dust dev team. Whether it be a coder, artist, writer, you can be a part of the forging the new, new alternate world. Have fun. Sign the Red Dusk US team. Cool. Basically, too long to read. Basic USA content right now. We'll expand in the future. You can all political power, so. We're led by a guy named Dan Quayle. We've got quite a few uh, natural spirits, but we have the aftermath of the uneasy 90s. <coughs> The 1990s were the United States, were a period of confusion, of stagnation, of gridlock, and of inaction. We didn't exactly fall, but we didn't rise either. Our nation faced a period of unrest, inability, and most prominently of all, unease. Everything felt like it was on a breaking point, and though Quayle was able to barely inch or cinch the election against Brown, it proved to us that maybe, just maybe, we're not as invincible, invincible as we hoped. We'll see about that. And then Quayle's America. What's worse than an unpopular president? A president who's unpopular because he hasn't held to a single campaign promise he made because he hasn't done anything he said he would. Because under him, seemingly nothing has gotten better. Though to the man's credit, nothing has gotten inherently worse, but most people aren't a glass half full type nowadays. With approval ratings as low as 39% by some estimates, Coyle's presidency hasn't done much to try and fix that uh, issue. Raising new taxes at the height of the recession, sending troops overseas once more to ensure a position in the Middle East, and generally being a quiet, almost reserved public official, mostly on account of Quayle's various growing health concerns. Just what is he hiding under all those smiles? <coughs> and the winner is... The winner is... So we gotta do a lot of this stuff here, too, so... Um, we've got some things here, so... On the world stage, the principles that should guide American foreign policy are simple. The world is safe when America leads. Only strength ensures peace and freedom. That America must stand with its allies and challenge its adversaries. Adversaries. In the spirit of our fight against communism, we must now lend our covert support to Eritrea and the struggle against the Ethiopian regime. Operation Awarid uh, Wali as Ethiopia's desperate attempt to crush Eritrean rebels, but we will ensure its failure through precise sabotage, paving the way for an imminent anti chemist rebellion in Ethiopia. We've stood against tyranny before, and now it's our duty to stand with Eritrea, ensuring their survival and preparing the ground for freedom to rise once more. So, the first value is the effects uh, the Ethiopians are currently getting, while the second value is the worst we can inflict on them. So, a lot of attrition. You know, so. <clears throat> We'll disrupt Ethiopian supply lines by planting mines along the major transport routes, medical facilities, basically same thing, leading to inadequate care for wounded soldiers, destroy supply depots by destroying key Ethiopian supply depots, force the troops to consume weapons and supplies at a high rate, incite crop destruction, destroy crops and resources that could be used for Ethiopian forces, spread disinformation, we'll spread disinformation among Ethiopian ranks, disrupting their chain of command, slowing their organizational regain. Sabotage cabin, uh, 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 communication networks. We'll conduct targeted sabotage of Ethiopian communication networks, severely hampering their ability to reorganize after engagements. We'll infiltrate our logistical night networks, we'll infiltrate their networks, and sub subtly reroute their supply chains, causing unexplained delays, delays in reinforcement arrivals, create transport bottlenecks, we'll delay Ethiopian reinforcement deployments, engineer landslides. Um, we will engineer controlled landslides and other obstacles to increase the terrain penalties for the Ethiopian forces and false landmarks. Manipulating local environmental actions and creating false landmarks will mislead. Ethiopian troops are in difficult terrains, so we can build nuclear war and move NATO. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization was originally formed to counter the threat of Soviet expansion during the Cold War, setting as a bulwark against the spread of communism in Europe. After the Warsaw Pact fell, we struggled to find the alliance's purpose in the rapidly changing world, but now, with the Soviet Union rising again and ready to strike Europe at a moment's notice, our mission has never been clearer. At the heart of the NATO strength lies the North Atlantic Council, where we, the member nations, come together to make critical decisions that shape our collective defense. This council ensures that our alliance remains united and responsive to any threat, coordinating our military strategies and diplomatic efforts. In these uncertain times, the North Atlantic Council is a guiding force, directing our actions and ensuring that every move we make is the best in the interest of our shared security. Now it's this. Counter-isolation settlements. 
launching a nationwide campaign to increase public awareness and support for American involvement in international conflicts. Conduct NATO joint military exercises. <coughs> Organize large scale joint military exercises in Europe to demonstrate NATO's readiness and commitment to defending its members and allies. Coordinate technology sharing. Facilitate the sharing of advanced military technologies and research findings among NATO members through the NATO Research and Technology Organization. Um, advanced training programs. Invest in advanced training programs and resources to significantly improve the training and effectiveness of soldiers across NATO. Military installation. Oh. This is in the Ramstein Air Force Base increases capacity and enhances strategic importance for NATO operations. Um, it's Aviano Air Base as well. Modernize in Cyrillic Air Base. It looks like in Turkey. Proof capabilities RAF Lockenheath. In the UK, enhanced naval station Orota, with its capacity for fleet operations and support NATO missions in the Mediterranean, and activity in Naples, modernized naval activities in activity Suda Bay. And the US, oh god, the US Congress. <coughs> Based in DC, the United States Congress is a bicameral legislative body of the federal government of the United States, comprised of the House of Representatives and the Senate which represents the states both proportionally equal in their seat apportionment, respectively, based on a first-past-the-post electoral system. The system, while somewhat complex in its functionalities, has a main legal authority within the nation that allows the Republican process to be carried out. Obviously, this means the President's authority is not absolute, and for the, any legislative action, he relies almost entirely on the Congress's consent. If he wishes to get something done, he must have the support of both the House and Senate, and they do so will have to negotiate compromise and fight to simply secure majority approval. Senate supports okay, House supports okay. All right, Republican, Democratic Party is hostile, Reform Party is unfriendly, Loyal Party is offer the full support to any past legislation. I already have to keep their interest in mind too. Friendly, are subject to supporting ideas, however, you shouldn't rely on them to push through unpopular legislation, and neutral, or neither for you or against you. Unfriendly, unlikely to support you, unless the proposed legislation is universally popular and there's hostile, never support you. So, improve Republican attitudes, re improve Reform attitudes, improve Democrat attitudes, and 1992, a year to decide. When 1992 came to pass, November elections were growing to be a tense battle for all sides involved. The Republicans under incumbent 41st President George W. H. Bush had been reeling from a mix bag of successes, now complicated by an economic recession that seemed only accentuated by the President's reneging on his promise to raise no taxes while in office. The Democrats had set forth with California Governor Edmund Gerald Brown Jr., a rising star within the Democratic Party, who sought to ease hostilities with the aging Soviet Union and cut back on the Reagan era military spending and economic plans. Out of the blue, an up-and-coming Texas multimillionaire, who decided to throw his hat into the presidential ring, that being Ross Perot, and soon to be declared Reform Party, standing as a strong third option against the Democrats and Republicans for internal change across the board. All three sides had their issues, all three of them had their strengths, but none of them could rightly predict the outcome of their elections to come, was simply by the density of the concern in the air. <coughs> Bush's image. Though Bush is in a hiccup in the East. Uh, by the hiccup in the East, was still in the gutter due to the ever-present economic malaise and his reversal on his anti-tax position. Brown may have been indecisive when it came to the decision-making, but the public embraced his California hope approach during times of economic hardship. Ross Perot was a newcomer who challenged both parties with widely demanded issues, but was indeed outside of the two-party primacy and now nowhere near guaranteed victory, even at the stage level. The Republicans were reeling, the Democrats struggling, and the Perot's gang desperately clinging on to whatever support they could get. And all began to culminate together just in one of not the most tense elections of the 20th century, just not just in America, but globally. We need a political power, holy crap. The election was, for all intents and purposes, up in the air, even until the night of, and no one quite knew well what was going to happen between the popular voter and the Electoral College, was even blurring the lines of how the states would vote. When voting began on November 3rd, results struggled to be tallied until early in the morning on the 4th, when every television radio and speaker in America blared out before crowds of millions of bated breath, Brown has been elected the 42nd president. Huh. Economic ramifications. You know, workers seemingly do one thing better than all other things. Not work, apparently, in recent times. The job market has so many openings not because of the old layoffs from the recession, but because people are outright refusing to work until Quail can offer them economic stability. They may have raised tax, but it's not like there's a pandemic going on right now, locking people in their homes. <laughs> oh, wow. They're going to go all back to work whenever they find a new job. And you hear they say complaining and demanding extra stimulus to get them through the crisis? Lazy guys. So who the heck is Dan Quayle? Throughout the U.S., people joke that there couldn't be a worse time for him to be president. Some said that not even FDR had to face such economic and political challenges. James Danforth Quayle, however, was aware of such derisive words, yet he does not give them much weight for he knows better. 
Born in Indianapolis in 47, a rich family businessman, Quayle graduated in political science and after pursuing a small career as a journalist, tried his hand in politics. Joining the House of Representatives at 29, becoming the Senator 33, the youngest senator ever elected up to the point. Thanks to the praises from outgoing President Reagan, Quayle was chosen by Republican candidate George Herbert Walker Bush as his running mate in the 1988 elections. Bush's administration helped little in improving the image of the Republican Party. His tax raise was enough to get Brown in office in 92. Luckily, though, Brown's poor foreign policy echoed the nation and gave Republicans a chance to win in 96 with a new face, that of Dan Quayle. Now, Quayle sits in a divided house. The two-party system has been ruined by Perot and his lapdogs. The economy has left stagnation uh, or stagflation and is entering full recession in the United States. And the Soviet Union carries on, leaving a trail of desperate nations willing to cooperate for protection. Truly an FDR esque setting. The outcome of 92. What marks an upset for the ages? Brown managed to trounce Bush on election night, marking his victory of 341 at 190, with Ross Perot having stolen six by taking the states of Maine and Alaska. Wow. The most contentious election ever since 1860, claiming one CNN pundit in the aftermath of the election. The Democrats, as of this time, were in a celebratory mood, having to throw in the long-time ruling Republicans, taking back the presidency with the majorities in both House of Congresses, or Houses of Congress, though they lost a good bit of their traditional support base of Perot's economically social platform and the Republican Party's avidly anti-communist sentiments, it wasn't enough to stop the Democrats' comeback. Brown's record as governor of one of the richest states in the U.S., though tainted by the recent King riots, have been a perfect tool when fighting against Bush's failed economy. Campaigning on modernity and economic reform, Brown has managed to cater to the interests of the middle class and northern based voters, allowing him to be viewed as a fresh new face that represents the country for new deeds. <coughs> Though Brown may have managed to win the presidency, he unfortunately was not able to win over his fellow Democrats, with both progressives and southern Democrats untrusting of a supposedly moderate agenda. This was not particularly aided when the Reform Party would grab itself a foundation in New England where Ross Perot, despite being a southern in northern lands, had made a name for himself as a man with a plan. A balance between the Republicans and Democrats, and an option that wasn't too far in either direction. The outcome, however, all, put America on a rather unstable path, and the following months were just as tumultuous. Jared Brown's first few months in office would be relatively smooth, with economic relief packages and government investments aimed at reviving domestic industries, pro providing a brief pause in the long-running economic downturn. Unfortunately, this would be the end of Brown's successful agenda, with the first known as coffin coming from abroad in the Yugoslav Wars. In the war that Bush handed down to him, Brown would make the critical of air halting the mass bombings of Yugoslav strategic positions in Serbia for the sake of peace and preventing further conflict. The war would go on and develop his presidency, with the public eventually growing sour over his lack of action in the theater, worsened further by the revelation of the extent of the Yugoslav war crimes perpetrated by, against Croatians, with Brown giving minimal aid to the anti-Yugoslav forces. The initial protests and divisions between Brown and the congressional Republicans would become the start of a long spiral for America, and what would be later known as the Uneasy 90s. What do we got here? The Constitution? Written and ratified in 1789 by most states, the Constitution of the United States and its entailed Bill of Rights is the foremost document that makes America the land of the free in the world. More than mentioned in Angola? The prolonged civil war in Angola, which has been ongoing since 1975, because we can't send volunteers, unfortunately, shows no signs of ending. However, CIA, recent CIA reports indicate a significant increase in Soviet military presence in Angola, raising concerns about a possible defeat of UNITA. Additionally, the MPLA government's support for Kaliba, the Second Congo War, could lead to a disaster in the North and severely weaken the U.S. influence in Africa. Although we have provided arms to UNITA, it seems insufficient to overthrow the MPLA. There have been suggestions of another military venture in Africa, but the domestic public opinion risks are unpredictable and cannot be underestimated. It's time for Africa, my boys and girls. <coughs> We're get America's getting involved. So we got a lot of heavy infantry guys here like this. Um, with be this being Africa, um, there's a lot of jungles, hills, mountains. I think it would be best if we did send him like a single like infantry division. We do have marines, which I do like. And you guys are 20 combat, so actually you don't have almost anything on you. That's really bad. Welcome aboard. Uh, it's fine, whatever. Mm. The uneasy 90s? The Yugoslav protest, as they would later be called, was the first step in many of the descent towards ascension and the needs of the 90s. A dangerous president that seemed to be the road towards a greater time of unrest. That never really came. Just, uh... When everyone thought the American nation was on the brink of massive rioting, the chaos seemingly just stopped out of nowhere. The protests, though lengthy, were steadily replaced by an American public growing increasingly disillusioned with the new face of America, an ideal that Brown had campaigned off of. 
It helped that the Browns' economic plans had only mild impacts on unemployment and overall were ineffective when dealing with the downturn. This era was in no way for the American nation, particularly bountiful and prosperous, but at the same time, neither was it violent and bloody. While the old odd ride or two still broke out on cities between members of both the left and right, the decade itself didn't follow the trend of the rise of the 60s. Instead, it followed more of the aftermath. No one knew exa- entirely how to feel. The entire nation entered a sort of gray zone, an imbalance in the universe itself, as the entirety of America sat on by it for the ride. The tensions around every system were palpable, palpable, as though no one could reach out and grab it, and yet it never came. No great eruption, no horrible collapse, time simply moved on, and no one could entirely believe it. President Brown will continue to fight on and weather the storm for the next four years of his term in office, battling with Congress over social reforms, building relations with the former Eastern Bloc nations, even working to oversee the con- reconstruction of Germany following a period of unrest and the reintegrated East in one of his few victories. Ultimately, however, Brown's successes were overshadowed by his domestic and political failures, a sort of spot that would be bitterly exposed in the 1986 elections. This election would see him pinned against Bush's vice president and new former frontrunner for the Republican Party, Dan Quayle. But not as good as a public speaker's Bush, he had new opportunism that greatly interested just enough American voters, culminating in his 281 electoral college votes victory against Brown's 222. This election, similarly to the former, would see Perot play his hand in the race with the Reform Party making an impressive demonstration and receiving nearly 30% of the popular vote, and taking all the states in the England area, earning him 35 electoral votes. With the three parties in the Senate and Congress by the end of the decade, the government had been much rather slowed down, and an inability to respond appropriately to many issues. The emergence of the tripartisan politics, the struggle to find a solution to the Soviet issue had left America in a position of indecisiveness. The government by 1997 was now feeling the full effect of the nation itself and felt division that did not tear asunder, a break in the chain and yet the continued march of progress. Time stood still and yet it still flowed onwards. It was, the name implied, all in the state of unease. I guess unease is better than suffering? I guess. Alright, so where are we at? <coughs> stagnation crisis. Okay, fine, maybe the crisis is getting bad. The recession's one thing, but when the recession turns into stagnation rather than a growth it becomes a stagnation, things become qu- quite a bit of a con- crisis. All would have been fine had we just entered a period of slowdown from the brown side period of growth, but now we're getting stuck in an era of downturn. When the stocks began to crawl away from the downturn in 98, we'd hoped it'd be the market kicking back into gear, but unfortunately, things didn't improve much beyond that slowdown. While things are not actively getting worse, if they don't get starting getting better, they might as well be. In response, we're going to take a page from George H.W. Bush, release the stimuli. Where are we now, though? With the turn of the century into the year 2000, the United States now presses on to what looks like yet another divided election. While Quayle had been a relatively successful president, the divided Congress and Senate prevented him from making many effective changes as the uneasy 90s had rolled out the door, and the American economy and the nation starting to feel the recourse of these consequences. The economy's nation growth is at its lowest since the Great Depression, and though it was up, so was inflation rising in the back of the Cold War deficit spending. Quayle's illness, too, with Flebitis wasn't much helping his image as a strong and virile president, and the Democrats and reformists are willing to use that to try and discredit him, though the damage has already been done, and no side involved was willing to attempt to put a match to the still fading aura of the 90s. But look at how many civvies we're building. No one knew what to do. Barely anyone knew how to react. Life went on, and now the American people were starting to shake off the miasma that had hung over them for eight years. The economic bubble looming on the horizon, as well as the jubilance of the new year, had helped shake off most of the unrest and undecisiveness among the public. But there are still many skeptical voices in the faces of what seemed to be the next torch thrown wildly into the darkness of the unknown. And the Soviet Union still trudging along, with the government divided as ever, and with NATO starting to grow more and more fed up with American practice up to this point, all eyes are now turning to the land of the free to get off the ground and start marching. Johnny came marching home, from far worse, and surely this wouldn't be the end of the Yanks, and surely they would come out swinging, right? Surely this is the moment when the star single banner f- brave flew, b- flew bravely in the air, on land and sea, well, no one really knew, except at least so Americans. Will the nation finally get back into gear, finally deal with the myriad of problems in front of them, finally put an end to the unease? What happens next? Well, we'll have to wait and see. I don't mind helping attack, especially if it'll slow them down, maybe. Because we don't want these guys to get encircled here. Hopefully Jack Keane learns a lot, and we can't do anything here, but they made it so they didn't get in which is the most important thing for us right now. 
I mean, yeah, it doesn't look like we can really do very much. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? Since we're here, we can show this stuff. I mean, doing this stuff isn't not a bad. Vinito? Uh, eh, sure, why not? You know, we'll do all these at the same time. Why not? Because we can. Oh, there's all this stuff, too, which hopefully you don't need to get really involved with, but whatever. Oh, you're getting attacked, too, huh? Oh, look at that naval XP. Woo! Very nice. Welcome to Quell's America. Happy March, everybody. Um, three party primacy. Contrast to prior years, American nations seemingly become a three party nation rather than the usual two party. Well, this does help allow the, the political divide to stay away from the usual us versus them mentality. It allows Mexican legislation through much, much more difficult. Legacy the Glass Gal Act. Fragile. In the 30s, the banking system in North America and Europe collapsed due to the Great Depression. In 1929, on the eve of the crash, there were over 26,000 banks operating in the U.S. By the time President Roosevelt temporarily suspended banking activities on March 5, 1933, fewer than 15,000 banks remained, with 5,000 banks having failed in 32 alone. The temporary suspension ended the widespread rush of depositors to withdraw the widespread uh, withdraw their funds from banks across the country. On March 9, the U.S. Congress swiftly passed the Emergency Banking Act as one of the first steps in imposing significant restrictions on private financial institutions. Three months after the Emergency Banking Act. The U.S. Congress passed a banking act, known as the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933. It would be only a slight exaggeration to say that we owe the Glass-Steagall Act for pre preventing another collapse of the U.S. banking system for 50 years. For most Americans, the significance of this law lies in the establishment of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, which protects interests of households to depositing money in the event of a bank failure. However, the protection of depositors wasn't the factor that prevented a systematic banking crisis over half a century. That success was due to the law's strict and direct control over banking activities. Perhaps most importantly, the act prohibited banks from engaging in speculative activities, including in the stock market. The greatest achievement of this law was making banking a safe and somewhat dull industry. However, the Depository and Institutions Deregulation and Monetary Control Act was passed in 1980 and is considered the first major step in overturning the glass uh, Steagall Act. This legislation, instead of imposing further controls, and in the Federal Reserve's regulation of interest rates on deposits. This deregulation paved the way for the U.S. financial system following its first crisis in over 50 years, specifically involving savings and loan associations. As a general rule, financial crises are rarely without some cons consolation, consolation for the financial capitalists themselves. The savings and loans crisis had the beneficial effect of reducing competition, helping bring several large U.S. banks closer to achieving market dominance, a key position that they could never have dreamed of while the Glass-Steagall Act was fully in effect. If nothing changes, what awaits the United States are cyclical financial crises. We're moved in about a week. Holy crap. That's not good. Second Amendment. Oh, yeah. Part of the Bill of Rights, probably the most vital of American liberty, the right to bear arms, is one of the most outstanding gun rights legislations in the world, allowing all American citizens to privately own arms and arm themselves. With caveats, of course, with this behind every blade of grass stands an American with a rifle. Oh, that's right. <coughs> Stagnant economy. Oh, God. Wow, we have 70% consumer goods factor reduced from, for us. We still have so many factories. Love it. Though President Quell was able to settle the major issues of the deficit in the uneasy 90s recession, the economy is still struggling to maintain a positive growth. Malapportionment, legislative indecisiveness, and overall inability to agree on a plan that has left American nation moving towards stagnation. Ailing Quail. Quail had always been a man who never knew what to quit. Between working in both House and Senate, working for George H.W. Bush as vice president, and now working his butt off as president, Quail had been for many years under layers upon layers of stress. And in a way, at the very lining of the man's soul, most recently, the lining of his stomach. He couldn't shake his constant gut pains, only accompanying the steering, searing ache in his legs. Quail had always tried his best to keep his medical mysteries to himself, and out of the public eye, but in recent times, it's becoming more and more difficult. His presidency has not exactly been popular or successful, as shown by the Carter asked Mount and Times of Congress to shut down one of his bills or plans, alongside his abysmal approval ratings of the polls. If things don't start to turn around soon, the man might just blow a gasket or might blow through yet another pack of cigarettes. Opposition members have even t taken to calling the man ailing quail in a reference to a seemingly escalating hitch to smoking as a coping mechanism. With elections approaching fast, many question whether quail will be able to hobble his way into the president party primaries or not. Quail's ales may soon become America's. And that wouldn't be a good thing now. How do we not have enough fuel? Daily gain. I mean, we're, we're training a lot, but still. Hmm. 
We need to throw in some support already too. Look at that. Sure. Well, I don't think we need this one for now. How's that thing looking here? Oh! Not at all. Got a lot of options here. Hello. Stealth bombers? Sure. Well, I mean, we don't have any options to help them out. You know, we're never allowed to send volunteers, so. <clears throat> this you know, have a plasma amount of power. That's good. Oh, and these guys are killing each other, too. That's fine. It happens. And we got some worker strikes, stagnation crisis, three parties, of course. Quail's biggest failure. We stand in almost undisputed power for almost 130 years. We had our hiccups during the Depression a few times through the last century, but this is different. This is far more drastic of a loss. Rather than trying to defend our dominance, the script of the reformists and strike the Democrats while they're down, Quail stumbles and stutters his way through public events and refuses to take an aggressive stance against our opponents. We're watching our supremacy wane, and no matter who approaches Quail about the issue, it just doubles down. He calls it not ruffling feathers, even though he neglects the feathers that were ruffled long ago. And if he's not going to act sooner on part his feathers, will be ruffled right out of Capitol Hill. Well, everyone, here we're at. And, uh, yeah. So far, not bad in Angola. When we get involved, when America gets involved, sometimes we can do very, very well. Now we've got to make sure we hold on to this tile here. And, okay, good enough. Let's help out them. So I did increase this by a little bit. I did throw on some support toad artillery. That's why our army XP is so low. Um, the stimulus arrives. On the wake of growing worker protests, strikes, union population, of course, and so on and so forth, the Quail administration has decided it's time for the government to finally do something. Finally get moving on the reform. People are so heavily demanding. They want stimulus? Fine. It goes against just about everything we stand for, but fine. We'll draft up a little bill to include some trinket benefits for health care and un unemployment. Some subsidies to get people to shut up and get back to work at the very most. What's the worst that could happen? When the bill finally meets the Senate floor, the debate is seemingly quite fierce over whether or not the bill is accepted or acceptable. The Democrats, is as obvious, accuse Quail of being an agent of corporations and businesses, while the reformists batter down the hatches while throwing the Quails against uh, the welfare of his own people. There were, of course, expected responses, but surely some of them would vote against uh, support of the bill, right? At least they can clap for the coming election season, right? Things began to rapidly deteriorate when several Republican members of the Senate also began to voice distaste for the bill, with one Senator, Ted Stevens of Alaska, claiming that the bill is an open insult to the suffering of the people of America, and that it would be completely overthrow the budget. The party lines had seemingly been broken, and soon enough, all bets were off, with most of the Senate quickly rallying against Quayle's bill. Let's hope at first, and soon enough, it was trampled when the majority leader revealed the results of the vote. The Senate has decided a vote of 25 to 75 does not support the Quayle economic stimulus bill. We do have quite a bit of a uh, political power here. Which is nice. This guy's still suffering up there. Um, what do we want this? Is that just a network? It takes 14 days. We can build a nuke, but I'm not sure which would really help us out. Oh, we can build it up again? Ah, sure, why not? Because we can, you know? Oh, is this one? Oh. Oh, so doing Ethiopia proxy. Interesting. What do they can't reinforce? Maybe that's a bad idea. We need to get some more support, too. Nice job, guys. Quail's illness. Rather than recover, the pain only got worse and worse by the day. It had been years since it started, but for some reason it just wasn't stopping. The pills, medication, and massages and comp compression all had failed to stop the deep, throbbing pain in his legs. The doctor said he'd be fine and we have no issue as it went as with it as time went on, but then why Christ's holy name really still burning? The itch wouldn't go away, the inflammation never went down, and the red spot coursing through his side never really gave in. It was as if he was suffering from someone constantly rubbing poison ivy on his legs, and he could never wash off the oils. If he had to suffer with another moment, he'd probably start screaming about the Oval Office and Tizzy. Mr. President, a voice came in from his secretary's room, familiar and yet muffled under his own thoughts. Quill looked up at the door and barked with an unenthusiastic groan, come in as a response. Through the door, stepped a friend, a close one. The family doctor, of course. Did he have another prescription? Another drug? No, he just had a stack of papers. 
an oddly depressed look on his face. The president had been so busy with the past several years moving around and taking so many darn tests that he hadn't seen the man in so long that he almost didn't recognize his face. Dan, I'm sorry to say this to you, but your test came your test results came back. What well, started as a small affliction, well, because you never left it arise and cleared up has become much more severe. Between smoking, moving around the country all the time, and the endless stress on your so shoulders, Mr. President, you have Buger disease. What is Buger disease? Basic resource extraction. Uh, that one. Resource extraction speed. Radar? Sure. Alright, uh, so you are attacking, kind of crazily, truth be told. So I to see if there's a river here or not. It looks like there might not be, so. There you go. Probably not. Ethiopian campaign crumbles. Uh oh. Ethiopia's uh, word Wally campaign is faltered, unable to defeat the EPLF before the start of the summer. Making, marking a significant victory for covered and sabotage efforts. Our meticulous actions have ensured Eritrea's resilience, and now we can rest easy knowing that the operation's failure will have disastrous consequences for the communist regime. With the Ethiopians in disarray and their plans thwarted, the stage is set for the inevitable anti-communist rebellions to take root. Good job, man. Oh, good. Oh, so they completely got rid of them. Now we can build a nuclear warhead with access to weapons-grade uranium. We can construct a nuclear warhead for us. For use. Counter isolation sediments. Well, we could really use that actually for war Holy crap, it's really bad for us right now. Uh huh. Currently active in the Kingdom of Spain. Well, that's cool. Coordinate technology sharing. Accentuate training programs. Well, you know what? We can counter this. Why not? I think that'd be really good for us. We could use more uh, war support and whatnot, too. Rebellion in Ethiopia. Look at that. Yay! Rest in peace. Oh, wait. Oh, whoops. Our job here is done. But you didn't do anything. Like I said, our job here is done. Nice. Um, with that in mind, ooh, who do we have? Political advisor? Donald Rumsfeld? Minister of Finance, that's not bad. Foreign Minister, Condoleezza Rice. Minister of Defense. Um, truth be told, I don't know what, where we're going to go with this, so I'd rather grab someone <coughs> that we can use for a while. Oh, we can't do this too. Air reformer, ground reformer. Ooh. Assume if tree. So I don't know what route we're going to take for this campaign, so I might just choose like Tommy Franks maybe? I don't know. Nah, it's getting attacked pretty harshly. Uh... I don't know if you can actually win there. Move around a little bit more. Waiting for the election. Oh God, elections are coming, the elections are coming. Raise the alarm, the elections are coming. The Republican Party has chosen a candidate as all, of the, all the others. Debates are underway, polls are flying up across the nation, and people are settling in. Preparing for the day that announces it all, preparing for the vote that will change the course of American history to be. This is the moment that will define the next decade whether the uneasy 90s continues onwards or if America can make the rebound, or worse, if she'll fall further. Independence Day celebration? Happy July. Before stepping before the crowd and barely being able to walk without wincing, President Quayle stepped out of the White House balcony a big wave and a bigger smile. The atmosphere was right, the people were in full swing, and the joy of the air was unrivaled as American flags flailed in every direction. The tens of thousands of onlookers and dozens of television cameras all looking at him from down on the ground. It was a beautiful sight in all ways, as it had been the past three times he'd done this exact thing, but this town was to be a little different. Of course, the main attraction was to be fire addressed by Americanism, and the declaration would have meant to hold your hand on your heart with a hot dog in your mouth at the ball game. All the usual flag-waving stuff, and those after the celebration of Independence Day, but he couldn't quite shake the feeling of dread of what was about to, he was about to say. And the cheering finally subdued, or subsided after the ending, as in his long-winded speech, about freedom ne freedom's never forgotten, he finally took out his extra sheet of paper. The smile slowly crumbled off his face as he looked out at the crowd, addressing them once more with a tone what well, might call shake him. <clears throat> now today, I have one final announcement to make. It is with great pride that I have served as you are. He droned on for about ten minutes of how grateful he was to be president, and how great the people were, and how amazing America was. Yes, 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 everyone gets the message, but then he made this final statement. This one didn't so much resonate with the cheers as it did with the stunned silence from some and appalled gasp from others. Due to personal reasons, I'll not be running for rerunning for president upcoming 2000 election. Sounds relatively uh, recent about someone else, however. 
Let's get more organization first. Um, can you not reinforce or something here? Oh god, that's really not good. That must be a bug. Like, I've had this happen before for me as well. Not ideal. I can't recall uh, volunteers either. Can you get us another one? No, darn it. We can just get rid of it and improve it from there, but still. Oh man, they're really attacking really, really hard. Well, it's the first campaign in America. We don't want to lose here, do we? Worker strikes, waiting for the election. <coughs> the winner is. This is it. This is the make or break moment. This this decides if we stay in office or we follow the silence of history. Will we survive? Will the Republican Party live on in their successor? Or will we trample beneath the feet of our rivals? Only time, of course, will tell. All right, so we did win in Angola. Don't worry about that. Don't worry what happened there at all. Um, but the Republican Party primaries of 2000. The primaries have once again arrived with multiple candidates attempting to get the head of the Republican Party. Between all the candidates, speeches are made, the points are rebuked, and criticisms are all placated, culminating in one winner merging in the primaries. Thus, the nominees go to Alan Keyes, John McCain. I don't know who Alan Keyes is, so I guess we'll go with John McCain. Look, I'll be honest, I have no idea what route we're going to go with, so we're here to have a good time. What else we get here? Overbloated military spending, the Cold War wasn't just a political and social upheaval, but the threat of communism in the States also led to a massive, several decades long fight to overpower the Soviets and the Chinese every step of the way. Well, this costs a lot of money, resources, and soldiers, and as it stands, we're starting to see the negative outcomes of a 50 hour long pissing contest with the Russians. In the last bastion. What sets America apart as the last bastion on Earth? It proudly stands as an unparalleled guardian of freedom and a global exemplar of democracy and capitalism akin to a radiant city on the hill. This distinction is intricately tied to the cherished system of a representative. Republicanism that is deeply woven into the fabric of the American nation. This unique governance model comes with an array of remarkable nuances and complexities which have been embraced and refined over the course of the nation's history. It is through this commitment to democracy, capitalism, and the enduring principles of representative republicanism that America has become a symbol of liberty and a stalwart defender of democratic values on the world stage. This nation and a God shall have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. From Abraham Lincoln. Good old Abe. And through a three party primacy, in contrast to prior years, the American nation has seemingly become a three-party nation rather than the usual two-party, of course. Which, luckily, we read earlier. And we have the Cold War modifier, too. <coughs> this video will get modified with each proxy war we win. Democratic Party primaries. The primaries are once again arrive with multiple candidates attempting to get the head of the Democratic Party. Between all the candidates, speeches are made, points are rebuked, and criticisms are placed all culminating in one winner emerging in the primaries. Al Gore. Liberal Party. Uh, Joe Lieberman. Uh, I think... I remember Al Gore more than Joe Lieberman. Of course, I was really young when this all was happening. Um, I, I honestly don't care which one. Either one. Let's go with Al Gore. Can you see any volunteers? I don't think so. Look how smiley this guy is. Ernest Wamba Diawamba. Actually, I'll say the one that's the Kabila's leadership. Oh, Laurent Dazare Kabila. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Reform Party primaries. The Reform Party primaries have come once again, with a party ever so divided between the left and right inner party circles. Whichever faction comes out on top will spear the direction of the party and even the country for the next four years. Some major arguments here and some petty accusations there. Eventually, the Reform Party will side with Donald Trump, Joe Hagelin, Pat Buchanan. We gotta go with Donald Trump. I mean, I don't even know who John Hagelin is. Pat Buchanan sounds familiar, right faction? Pat Buchanan. Is he the religious guy? I'll go with that guy. Now, can we do this again? Uh, honestly, we could probably use it. We're going to use that worst part probably later on. Donald Trump versus Al Gore versus Dan Quayle. What the heck? As the dust settles after the primaries of the election year, the Times Company decided to choose your allegiance in the upcoming presidential elections. Republicans, Democrats, safe the ideas of the American system, or the reformists, a new path for the millennium. <coughs> oh man I've been told multiple times to try on play as America and because I didn't know like I've seen Jeb Bush become president eventually I, I don't know who becomes leader um just for the memes I want to go with probably Trump just for the memes of it 
Because, I mean, John McCain's alright, I guess. Al, Al Gore's alright, I guess. I don't know. But, you know, knowing it's September in 2024 when I'm recording this video, I've been demonetized and whatnot. I've already got a strike on my channel. You know, why not? Screw it. What's the point? If I get another strike, my channel's completely dead, pretty much. So, unless you move to Rumble, where I'm at again now. But whatever. Raytheon. When in doubt, buy your Raytheon stocks. We're going to get involved in another war eventually, anyways. Uh, Klaus Air Sport and Ice. Uh, yeah, better production cost. Boom. No nukes, unfortunately. Transitional government established in Ethiopia. Look at that. Oh. Pieces are returned to Ethiopia for how long? I bet you're looking a little thicker. Collective leadership. A generation of warriors. Look at that. So what's next for us, then? Waiting for the election. Quails, qualms. Got a few more days for that one. Still building, building, building. You know what? Screw it. We could use more... Uh, well, honestly, we could use more infrastructure overall. Are we building this much? Look at all these millies and civvies we want to build, too. Why wow, we have so much rubber in uh, Illinois? We get a lot of uh, uranium or nuclear materials down there too in uh, South Carolina. Huh. After all, we have a giant infrastructure bill coming through. I'm not sure we're gonna get infrastructure later on, but we'll get more resources too, and we can really use it. 2007 Olympics, nice, very nice. Well, it's October. Ah, uh, nothing like a good old election year. <coughs> Excuse me. Quail's qualms. Quail doesn't see many things in his day. Oh, wait, we're supposed to help vote for people? Oh, crap, I forgot about this. Um, been all around the world, talk with kings and prime ministers, signed bills and forced through orders, and yet his moment is that that gets to him. The moment that decides the fate of the party. The primaries in the party were, of course, successful. If Quail won't man the helm in the wake of his illness, then we'll have to. It's about to be that referendum whether or not they get to get to or some other schmuck does. Quail puffs back a cigarette while I reads early po pollster remarks. That line's mostly read the same. Some drivel about the Democrats and reformers are due for an easy ride into the House and Senate. How the presidency's up in the air and how everyone knows the Republican Party is about to face their greatest challenge yet. The smoke is a little calm presents the nerves as the newspaper rides through the eyes. Is Quail done for? One asks ask one editorial. And that seemingly was a straw that broke the camel's back. With a long dragon, equally long side of follow-up, Quail looked out the window of the Oval Office and said, I'm going to throw someone out this window someday. The U.S. election stands as a beacon of democracy in the face of global uncertainty. The importance of the smooth transition of power is paramount, a safeguard against the looming specter of high geopolitical tensions. Against this backdrop, the political landscape of the United States is sharply divided between the Liberalist Democratic Party, the Conservative Republican Party, and the Centrist Reform Party, each vying for control of the nation teetering on the brink. In this polarized atmosphere, the outcome of the election carries immense weight in shaping the destiny of the Union, You're siding with the Reform Party. Swing to... Oh. Okay, so the mid Mideast... Mid-East is like here-ish. Yeah. Swing, Republican minuscule, New England. Swing, substantial in New Hampshire. Great Lakes. Oh, God. Appalachia, minuscule. Deep South, Midwest, Pacific, Rockies. Campaign of the... Okay. Add uh, popularity to every state in the region. And then media interviews. I should have done this earlier. U.S. Code, Title II, Section 7, a section often referred to as the President's Election Day Act, since the first Tuesday of November is the first day for regular federal elections. Throughout the rich tapestry of American history, every presidential election is steadfastly adhered to this date, remaining unyielding even in the face of challenges such as the Civil War and World Wars, underscoring the nation's enduring commitment to the democratic process. Oh, and the campaigning, too. Well, crap. I should have been doing this earlier. National Wide Poll. If I have a nationwide poll, we can gain a more accurate list of the current popularities of each party in each state. And televised a campaign. Well, crap. I should have not. I should have done this. My bad. Of course, we don't have a lot of political power to begin with, but... Uh, for example... The swing minuscule... Uh, minuscule is not good for us. Huh. Significant support in Arizona. Rocky Mountains. Hmm. Swing moderate. So Great Lakes would be good. Great Lakes, maybe the Midwest. 
in Oregon and whatnot, or, you know, I guess the Pacific. Well, we have a current resolution for NATO. Quarterly military support for Poland. In light of covert intelligence reports indicating that the potential successors of the recently resigned Soviet General Secretary Gennady Yanayev are considering a renewed path to research influence in Eastern Europe, the North Atlantic Council has called upon enhanced support for Poland, Europe's first line of defense against communist resurgence. Recognizing Poland's pivotal role in safeguarding the continent from Soviet aggression, their resolution proposes the establishment of a quarterly Lend-Lease initiative, ensuring that vital military equipment and resources supply to the Polish forces on a regular basis, rather than sporadically. This commitment not only reinforces Poland's capacity to resist any Soviet advances, but also sends a clear and unambiguous message to the world. NATO stands firmly with Poland in its defense of freedom and democracy. So, yes, it's successful. Well, it looks like it's going to be successful, so we'll go with the yeah for now. Also, uh, don't worry about how, how I did this, but uh, yeah, we're, we look like we're at the top here. The line presents projections for the upcoming elections vote distribution. <clears throat> I have to that note these projections may or not be reliable. Your advice to exercise caution, consider this information as a general guide rather than a definitive prediction. Now, if we do win here, and Trump doesn't have any content, we might have to go back. But yeah, substantial. Don't worry about how much uh, political power I had to spend. And yeah, I have no political power right now. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> Alright, it's November. First Tuesday of the month. Let's go. See what happens. Election night. Election night is upon us, and the countdown to the decides the moment has officially begun. They are thick with anticipation, as the voters are ta votes are tallied, and the new president is just hours away from shaping the destiny of the nation. Oh, this is a way too out of time. What's my, my bad? Uh, across this country, citizens anxiously await the results, and watching as the electoral map lights up with hues of red, blue, and perhaps even a shade of reformist purple. As a night of high stakes and pivotal decisions where every ballot echoes in the chambers of history. Oh, uh, we want this one. Can I do more gas? Um, give me a second here. There you go. That's better. God bless America. Oh, God. We should actually need to watch this. Look at this. Oh, man, who could have seen the Reform Party winning? Oh, look at that. A twist of fate. As the nation anxiously awaited the results of the recent election, none of the candidates secured, secured the 270 electoral votes needed for victory. Hmm. As unprecedented a scenario, the decision is now in the hands of the House of Representatives. The lower chamber now holds the key to the presidency, with each state delegation having one crucial vote. The anticipation is palpable as the Speaker of the House addresses the press that declared outcome. God, you know America's in crisis when you have to do it like this. After thorough deliberation and passionate debate, I stand before you to announce that the House of Representatives has reached a decision. In this unprecedented situation where no candidate secured the requis requisite 270 electoral votes, the House has fulfilled its constitutional duty, and we declare that the candidates as the President-elect of the United States is from the... Republicans? Republican candidate. Will receive a mail spending the party's performance in the election. Democrats. Reformist. Hmm. Social democracy. <coughs> now he gives you the least reform, least thing here. So, look at that. That's a pretty solid South, except for something like Florida, Georgia, Texas. Of course, Democrats won California. Didn't totally rig this election. I totally didn't. I'm probably gonna get strike for taking this video down in a few months when this actually, you know, during the actual elections. Interesting. Look at all this. They even got like New England, New England. Look at that. It's pretty nice. Uh, Virginia went blue. All right, look at that reform party. Who could have seen that one coming? Ever since Ross Perot founded the Big Ten Reform Party, the party was internally divided into left and right factions. Many suspected the party to eventually overthrow the long-standing two-party system in American politics. Today, this vision has come to fruition as the reform party's left faction has emerged victorious in the 2000 elections, beating out both the Republicans and Democrats. This victory sent shockwaves throughout American politics, with the reform party now having a sizable influence in Congress. A new age of legislation has soon come to encompass the nation's people. The current left faction has made their agenda well known through the campaign, promising to go after the issues of poverty, expanding workers' rights, and health care. Bread and roses? Well, now we've got more focuses to do. The U.S. Armed Forces, which wouldn't be bad to do. Daily Army XP gain, Naval XP gain, and on the world stage. Fun anti terrorist operations. Oh boy. Well, let's go ahead and start. Ooh. Asia Theater, Great Asian War, Cambodia, Indian Flames, African Theater. Ooh. Let's go with this one. The U.S. Armed Forces. The Armed Forces were created more than two centuries ago uh, during the Revolutionary War. It became a part of our identity as a nation and part of a pride. It consists of four main branches, each with a different role. The Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps. Not Space Force yet. Since we've stepped into the new millennium, we'll have to look at all the branches and determine how they should change and what doctrine they should follow. Take 
technology sharing, best training. Oh, everyone says yes for NATO. Okay. Well, I guess we're going to become social democrats here, so there's no point in doing any of that stuff yet. Um, I want to save the political power. You never know what you need political power for, so let's save it for now. The United States Army. The biggest and oldest branch for military has been fighting unjust tyranny since its inception. The mission is to preserve the peace and security of the U.S. and to fight and win our nation's wars by providing prompt, sustained land dominance and across full range of military operations and spectrum of conflict in support of combat and commanders. Quarterly military dis equipment dispatched to Poland. With the passage of the resolution to enhance our support for Poland, we're required to send military equipment as part of the established quarterly lend lease initiative. We have the discretion to choose which specific equipment to send, ensuring it best meets Poland's defensive needs. We expect to receive this request again in three months as we continue our commitment to bolstering Poland's defenses. Infantry? Mechanized armor? Can't afford anything? You can have the infantry equipment. There you go. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Yep. The Azos. The leader. Alright. Do we build all the infrastructure yet? Oh, whoops. I forgot. I reloaded the save. That's why the snuff is not here. My bad. That is my fault. Build the south because I'm sure they could use a lot better infrastructure in the south. And across the nation as a whole, too. I don't know. Playing as America again, it makes me kind of want to replay TNO America as uh, um, Alabama Senator Wallace, George Wallace, and just like force segregation through the northern states just for funsies. Again, ah, that was a good time. That was a really good time. We won Oregon, of all places. 78% in, in uh, Nevada, uh, Nevada, yeah. Absolutely smoked everybody in Minnesota, Minnesota with two T's. That's interesting. Iowa, Missouri. Yeah, totally didn't use the consequence for this to make sure we won. We won Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio. A lot of the Midwest great states, you know. Rocky Mountains. Deep South. New England. We, yeah, no, look at that. Southwest. We got smoked in Oklahoma, though. Woo! Appalachia. The Republicans had 100% of votes in Kentucky. In the Mideast, yeah, the Democrats just won like crazy. Dozens radar, not bad. Ballistic missile, sure, we got five racer slots. United States Air Force. The U.S. Air Fleet, basically the wing of a beloved eagle. The Air Fleet, although not as important as their infantry, is extremely crucial in the war between uh, between a battle won or lost. Therefore, we must correctly invest in it. By building new military aircraft, making certain modifications to the existing models, is simply investing in research. You don't remain the leading global power, military power, or by sitting on your hands and spending your nation's budget on welfare. Come on, let's roll up our sleeves and we have work to do. And the United States Navy. <clears throat> the United States of the U.S. of A. is one of the strongest naval powers in the world, having long been masters of the sea since the end of the Second World War. Our naval force consists of tens of aircraft carriers, signature battleships, hundreds of subs, and thousands of sailors manning these vessels. Such a, large, such a large power must manage its finances properly, which will be the topic of the next budget proposal. There currently allows an opportunity for increased funding to the Navy, with two possible places where these funds could be deposited. Our submarine fleet is the first one being a formidable factor within our naval power. Our submarine fleet has been a staple that could be amplified with increased funding. The same goes for battleships as well, being both intimidating and powerful. A booster in our budget can ensure our naval dominance for the next few decades and back on the world stage. Cool. Can't save more military factories. Not sure what to do with these, though. We just don't have enough resources, which is why we need to expand our infrastructure. And yeah, we'll go back in the world stage and let's see what happens. Oh, God, I love the elections. Uh, honestly, probably you really don't. It's mm, happening soon. Inauguration. With uh, the date striking the 20th of January, the new president elected in the 2000 elections will formally take control of the presidency. Well, we'll see how this goes. You know, I guess I, didn't, I did not imagine him being a social democrat right now well, i guess i could be a social democrat whatever i don't know electing him as president now he might not be a president in like when the u.s gets a content dump from the devs but regardless i'm gonna end it there that's one heck of an episode so um if you enjoyed the video please consider leaving a like subscribe if you're new check out my discord link in the description below and i'll see you tomorrow i'll also see what we can do with president trump thanks for watching have a great rest of your day